feel so excited being here today. Beloved brothers and sisters, we have been speaking on the true riches, the true riches. We have taken our text from Luke chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. There, Jesus emphatically made known to us that there is something called the true riches, which God gives to his children who are faithful. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. So we have been talking on this uh, topic, and I just want to more or less give a summary, a summary. To start with, the true riches is God's desire for his children to enjoy. The true riches is God's desire for his children to enjoy. And you remember 3 John 2. 3 John 2 says, I wish be, I said, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. That you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Also in uh, Psalm 35, verse 27, the Bible clearly there says that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his children. So the true riches is God's plan for your life, is God's plan for my life. Receive that God's plan today and enjoy it in the name of Jesus. The true riches is to live, have, and become all that God has created you to be. And we can summarize this in two words, is to have wealth and make impact. Wealth and impact. Wealth and impact is your portion, is my portion in the name of Jesus. There is a process, therefore, to acquire these true riches as contained in the Bible. And Joseph in the Bible is a role model, an outstanding example for us to learn from. So we have learned the four S's of Joseph, skills, service, self-discipline, and sacrifice, driven by a clear vision or dream. There is nobody who has practiced these keys of Joseph, setting a clear vision and dream, spend time to develop the necessary skills that will take you to your vision and dream, apply these skills in serving people, maintain self-discipline, and practices self-sacrifice that has not come to this same result that Joseph attained in his life. Praise the name of the Lord. So the law of reproducibility holds true the law of reproducibility holds true. Anyone who puts the four S's of Joseph's keys of success to practice will get the same result. Let me state categorically that one major differentiating factor in the life of Joseph was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that gives him wisdom. So the Holy Spirit remains the differentiator in our lives as Christians. Anybody who puts these keys to practice will get some results, will get good results. Even those who are not Christians. So let's face the truth, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, see a man diligent in his ways. He shall stand with kings. He shall not stand with mean men. So hard work brings success. Competence, skills, service will open a door for anybody. And when that door is open, you need self-discipline to sustain that door and continue to grow there. And you need above all sacrifice to stay the course till you come to the full fulfillment of your vision, of your dream, of the attainment of your destiny. Praise the name of the Lord. So it is the Holy Spirit that makes the difference between a Christian and others. As you know, a Christian is one who is like Christ. And the only identity of a Christian is the Holy Spirit. Many people can walk miracles. They call it supernatural power. 
There is the negative supernatural power that is not from God. And there is a positive supernatural power that is from God. So you can be deceived. Many people can achieve great success in life by their own effort. Many people can even maintain such self-discipline and look so righteous on their own that you can be deceived. But what nobody can fake is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. And so we need the Holy Spirit of God. And we can only get the Holy Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. The one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the way. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can receive the Holy Spirit of God. This Spirit of God is the Spirit of wisdom that guides us. It is the riches that we therefore attain through the help of the Holy Spirit that we can really say is the true riches. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to share my screen very quickly. So just to summarize, all what I have said, that Joseph had a clear dream and vision, and he developed skill. He applied his skill to serve. He was self-disciplined, and he understood the principle of sacrifice and practice, self-sacrifice, delaying short-term uh, gratification for a higher, greater, godly purpose, the big picture, the dream, the vision. As he put this into practice, he came to that ultimate goal that God Almighty kept for him. And this is what we're talking about, the four S's of Joseph. Powered, driven by a clear dream and vision. Let me make this emphatic statement again. That for a person with a vision, every trial is an opportunity for triumph. For a person with a vision, every trial is an opportunity for triumph. This was what Joseph knew and practiced. Joseph went through the four P's of trial what I call the trial and triumph of Joseph, the four Ps of Joseph's trial and triumph. I caption it, the four Ps of Joseph's triumph, triumph. The first P is pit. The second P is Potiphar. The third P is prison. And the fourth P is palace. Hallelujah. Joseph went from the pit to Potiphar's house. From Potiphar's house, he went to the prison. From the prison, he knew God had a greater place for him. He went to the palace. The Almighty God will take you from wherever you are. Are you in the pit? You are coming out of that pit. Are you in Potiphar's house? Oh, don't give up. Don't stop there. Don't think you have arrived. Keep the vision alive. God will take you from there. Are you in the prison where you suffer persecution? even for doing the righteous things. Don't give up. Continue. God will take you to the palace. This is what I call the four Ps of Joseph's triumph. The trial and the triumphs of Joseph. So I repeat that statement again. For a person with a vision, every trial is an opportunity for triumph. Praise the name of the Lord. So speaking of Joseph, he knew what his destination was. So a man with a vision knows what his destination feels like, what it smells like, and those who should be there. Anything that is not feeling like his destination, smelling like his destination, he doesn't see the people around whom he ought to see. He knows he is not yet at his destination. So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, enjoy your journey to your dream. Enjoy your journey to your destination. But let nothing stop you halfway. Let nothing stop you on the way till you get to that dreamland. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He says the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Are you still in want? Then that tells you clearly that you are not yet at that destination. Do not rest. Your God is taking you there. Did he not say the arm of the Lord is not short to deliver? He will deliver you from every pit, from Potiphar and his wife, from prison till you arrive at your palace in the mighty name of Jesus. This shall be your portion. This shall be my portion. This shall be the portion of all the children of God who faithfully trust the almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. I want to pause here and allow us to hold the discussion. The facilitator already have a set of questions. So I will allow him now read out the questions. And then we'll start the discussion from there. Because we want to make this um, to address your own issues and also to give you room. So go ahead and read the questions. First question that I have here is from the part where you talked about the Holy Spirit, where you said that um, a, a gift that is not used is is waste. To have a gift and not use it is waste. So the question there is, uh, what is the hard work required to hone a spiritual gift? What is the hard work honed, I mean, required to hone a spiritual gift? What is the work that is involved in you know, honing that spiritual gift? So that for someone who, for instance, has the gift of uh, speaking in tongues, I mean, the gift of healing or the gift of um, um, being able to, you know, teach how we live on it, you know, that's just an example. Praise the Lord. I yeah. think we should, add, we should address that right away so it will stay very simple. Now, you're very focused here. You're talking about spiritual gifts. So spiritual gift is given by the Holy Spirit. We, again, must have clarity on this one. So it is the Holy Spirit that gives spiritual gift. Praise the name of the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a cause, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts. Did you see that? But the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries but the same law, and there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit, and then the rest are listed. So what is the key point here? You've said it, it is, it is a gift. So it is the Holy Spirit who gives. So first of all, you have to receive the gift. Anything that is called a gift means you must be able to receive it. If you don't receive it, you can't have it. That's why I emphasize that the differentiating factor in the life of a Christian is the Holy Spirit. And you can only receive the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, okay? So let's establish that. Now, have you received the gift because you have the Spirit of God? It is the Spirit that manifests the gift as you have seen. So what is the work? The work is to serve by faith. Know that I have the gift, just like you've seen me uh, do now. Jesus said, pray for the sick, so pray for the sick. And maybe I may disappoint some people who may be thinking that I was going to say fast and pray. You don't need any fasting and prayer to receive the gift of God. Hear me and hear me clearly. You need fasting and prayer for yourself for your own problems and issues, to tune yourself, to tame yourself, 
to repent. You can do fasting and prayer to intercede. You can do fasting and prayer for actually anything, but it is not required. When it comes to the manifestation of the gift of the Holy Spirit, two things you need to know is to be able to receive the gift and to put it into use. And that use is to do what Jesus says in the Bible. So the hard work is to preach the gospel, is to pray for the sick, is to do exactly what the Bible says is in a word. The other third side of it is the personal side now that you need to really pay attention to, is to grow in the spirit because the spirit will be teaching you things giving you how he manifests these gifts in you, how he speaks to you, you have to learn to pay attention to those. That is the hard work. So if I summarize, number one, in receiving, by giving your life to Jesus and applying faith that you have asked God to give you the Holy Spirit and you have received the Holy Spirit, that spirit transforms, and that means you live the life that uh, is worthy of a man who has the spirit of God. It transformed life, a renewed life. Number two is to apply yourself according to the word of God and do exactly what Jesus says you should teach. You, you talk about somebody who has the gift of teaching. Yeah, you start teaching people. It's not somebody who will give you the platform this is another thing we need to learn. You have to know that God has given you the ability to teach, and so you create the room to teach. That's why I taught us and say volunteer. Start by teaching people around your neighborhood. Teach people in your household. Teach whoever is available. Teach. But of course, don't forget that you who have to teach ought to be taught, right? So you have learned and developed the skill. So it's not just teaching anything, teaching what you don't know. So you have to really also develop your own skill, which is also part of the hard work, practicing, developing yourself. So I think it comes down again to the uh, four principles that we have taught that you have to develop skill, you have to use it to serve. It is in the developing the skill and serving in the area of your gifts, in the area of your skills that you will see the manifestation. So uh, let me pause here. Maybe there are more questions or other things to add. So. The Holy Spirit manifests when we do those first two, like I have said, receive and uh, dedicate your time in exploring, yeah, and maturing that skill in by practice, by serving, and you see the Holy Spirit, who is the one who manifests his gift, manifesting the gift, create the platform. That's all the hard work that needs to be done, various ways, yeah. Uh, but specifically, it is in fasting and prayer. The gift is given to you. It's the Holy Spirit who gives the gift, and it's the Holy Spirit who manifests. So you should really then spend time in um, dealing and, and getting trained up by the, by, by the Spirit of God, observing and working as he trains you up. Also, um, the Bible is, 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 is the standard. I have already said that. And that, that, that's uh, my answer to those, uh, that, that specific question. I have to take this take time because, again, this is the foundation. This is the distinguishing factor. Like I said, that what differentiated Joseph is the Holy Spirit of God in him. Potiphar recognized that. Um, Pharaoh recognized that. The people that were with him in prison, the butler and the baker recognized that. So the spirit of God in us makes the difference. And we have to pay attention to the spirit of God in us and grow in that. Okay, I hope this has uh, addressed your question and a lot more 
of other questions that people may have. So that I've seen your line is open, so go ahead. Yes, 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 sir. It's, uh, it's addressed, it's actually nailed it so much on the head because I, I know when you preach, when you mention that thing, and then you said specifically a gift that is not being honed. You know, I will, really wanted to get clarity on that. And I think from what you shared, uh, it nailed it for me. It nailed it for me. Okay, brother Dara, let's have your next question then. Okay, so the next question comes from the part where you mentioned um, leadership. Now, yes. uh, the, it's, so this is it. I, I want to know your position on personal leadership, and that applies to the four keys. Because I know that if you cannot lead yourself, the idea of leading people becomes um, unreal. It becomes impracticable. So how, how does personal leadership come into applying these four S's to see results? In, yes, indeed. If you remember, uh, when we were discussing technical skills, thank you for that question, first of all. Thank you. When we were discussing technical skills, you remember that I said that all that rolls into your leadership skills, isn't it? Do you remember that? No, confirm, confirm to me that you recall that. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, okay good. Now, so all these four S's, at the end of the day, is really about your leadership. It is about your leadership skill. So personal leadership, and what other leadership do you really have? Leadership at the end of the day will always come back to you, who you are. <laughs> You see, so when I talk about personal leadership, they're trying to put it down to certain aspect of where, where you, you talk about your, um, your soft skills, like Sister Gertrude shared with us, right? The key of discipline in particular, you see, is really focusing on you, your own personal leadership, okay? So bottom line really is that leadership is always about you. It's always about personal it's actually always about personal. So remember what we, when we started, we started by defining leadership. Do you recall that? And I would want you to share with me what we said about leadership. Anybody? So indeed, Dara, simple answer is yes, all this is about leadership. Your leadership determines how high you will go, how far you will go. I want to share my screen. Look at this. Can you see this? How high one will enjoy through riches could be summarized as one's leadership, yes. which is one's degree of influence, according to John Maxwell, you know, in one of his books. He said, leadership is influence. Now, here is my definition of leadership. I define leadership as the sum total of one's impacts and achievements driven by one's skills set, talents, and behaviors, and their applications in serving people that is self, family, organization, society, nation, and the world at large. So how high do you want to go? It's all about your leadership. So what we are really talking about here is Joseph's leadership model. Praise the Lord. Hello, brother Dara. Did that cut it for you? Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm, I'm here, sir. Great. Great. So who else has a question or wants to say something? Remember, we were to study Genesis chapter 37 to 46 and then bring questions, contribution, so, uh, Brother Dara, again, talking about leadership, because it, it, there are so many aspects of leadership that people can get confused. But like I just made it, so there is um, sometimes people thinking, okay, position, positional leadership. 
to somebody that is in a position, you know, that that is leadership. Okay, yeah, to some extent, the person has been given a position of leadership, but that doesn't necessarily make that person a leader. If the person has not developed the personal leadership to drive results and delivery and performance, just like I mentioned earlier, in that position, you will soon see a lot of gap. You will soon see a lot of problems in that place. In some, income, uh, in some organizations, they will say that the person has been promoted beyond his competence. He has been promoted beyond his leadership capability. So again, I thought I should mention that to make it further clearer. So people, you don't mix up when people are occupying position versus somebody really having the personal leadership capability that he has developed that continues to take him higher and higher. So this was what worked for Joseph. And Joseph went in stages. First in his father's house, he was serving and they saw his leadership qualities. His brothers even hated him for that. Culminating in his dream, in his vision, as we have stated what his true vision, the real vision was. And he went from there to Potiphar's house. He showed that leadership again. He became the CEO of uh, Potiphar's house. And that led him to the extent that he has to be promoted. Amen. He was promoted to the prison yard, the third P. And in the prison, again, he showed that leadership, his skills, everything, his qualities. And that took him to the palace. So how high you will go in life is the sum total of your leadership capability. And all that we have said rose up into your leadership. Yes, uh, Sister Gloria, my beloved wife, has opened her line. Please go ahead and speak. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. Um, mine is a question, and at the same time, I don't know how to really put it, but it's just something that I've been pondering over. So if we look at the life of Joseph, which we've been studying, my own opinion of Joseph, I've seen him as a spoiled child in his father's house. And I'm just wondering, since we started this teaching now, I've been looking at his life again, and I'm like, that means Joseph wasn't really spoiled as I thought, or where did he learn these skills that he, because I didn't see him serve much in his father's house than he was the one reporting the brothers. He was more of being sent to check on them, give them food, but not really in the active duty. So I don't know, how do we, I don't even know how to put this question now, but as a parent, I didn't see that his father also really made him do hard work. But as a child also, from a child's perspective, mm -hmm. Joseph, that means he already trained himself, knowing even though he was called, he was the favorite of the dad and all of that, but he was still conscious of that. Excellent, that God point. Yeah, so, excellent point you have brought out. Let's make some key, very life issues that you have brought. Number one is favorite child, favorite child. Let's not run away from that. Oh, parents are, uh, uh, I won't say guilty, it's not, it's not being guilty, but this is very important, favorite child, yeah? There is, it is difficult for a parent or parents not to have a favorite child because there is always something that endears this child to the parents, right? Circumstances could even make the child be so endeared to the parent. And uh, on the other hand, the child's gifts, the child's talent, performance, all that endears the child to the parent, favorite child. I turn then the second point to a question. Having a favorite child or should favorite child necessarily be spoiled children or does, when a child is a favorite child, does that mean the child is spoiled? So spoiled, child, favorite child, a spoiled child. It's a favorite child, a spoiled child. 
Then number three is how do we manage this situation? This does that summarize it for you, ma? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great, 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 great. Good. But so, sorry, the last point I was trying to add that the, I don't. I'm not answering my question. I still want you to throw it. Up, but I noticed that in all these even as he's still looking mysterious in my head to some extent, Joseph was very conscious of the fact that God was with him. Yes. So I think that was, yeah, let me leave it there. I'm not answering it. But... Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's good to come to that realization that he was conscious that God was with him. But let's quickly look at some of the things you raised. So this is a subject. First of all, let's start. Parents, please, Try as much as you can to play down, showing to your children the one that is favorite. Of course, you know that God teaches us love. So we must learn to love our children. On the other hand, you children, whether you are the favorite or your sibling is the favorite, learn the big lesson from Joseph and his brothers. So Joseph was a favorite child of the father. The father made coat of many colors for him. And the brothers hated him. Don't hate your favorite brother. Don't hate your favorite sister because he could be the star in your house. The star in your house is not your enemy. The star in your house is to be loved so he can come and be that star that helps you. The star in your house has a destiny by God. It's not man that has made it so. So love the star in your house. The star in your house is for your upliftment. It's not for your fight and quarrel. Love your favorite child. So what really then makes the child favorite? I have said, I said sometimes circumstances, but let's use the obvious one around Joseph that you were talking about. No, Joseph wasn't a spoiled child in the concept of our own, uh, this thing. He was indeed a favorite child, but he was clearly gifted. And like you said, from childhood, he started showing those great potential, those great gifts. From self-discipline, as you already mentioned, that he reported the brothers. But look at it that he was serving. You talk about not doing great service. A child that didn't do great service wouldn't be the one they would send to go and deliver food to the brothers. And when he went, look at it, he didn't find the brothers. He took the initiative to ask the person he saw around. Let's read from 14. 14, he said, then he said to him, this father, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flock and bring back word to me. So he went. Then he came to 16. So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. So you see excellence from the beginning in the life of Joseph. In fact, your question has triggered something I have prepared. So maybe I should just say that here. I said some of Joseph's outstanding qualities, which I captioned something to know about Joseph something to know about Joseph. Please pick your pen and paper and write these 10 points down. Number one, he was a visionary and performance-driven leader. He was a visionary and performance-driven leader. Number two, he developed skills and competence. So he was a very competent person. Anything you gave him to do, he did it competently. Number three, excellence. Excellence was his driving force. He delivered excellent and quality service. Excellent, no shabbiness. Excellent and quality service. So, number two, I've said competence. Number three, excellence. Number four, he, he had 
people manage, managing skill. He was a people manager, people manager. Number five, he had positive person, personality. He was a positive person, a diehard optimist, a diehard optimist. Nothing made him to get into depression. Nothing made him sad. He followed his vision. He followed his dream. He was a positive person, a diehard optimist. Number six, rugged and resilient. Rugged and resilient. He was not somebody who sits down to cry in adversity. Nothing deterred him. Nothing made him look back. He pressed forward like Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are past, I press forward towards the mark of uh, God's high calling for my life. That is his vision. Number seven, he was a very forgiving person. He forgives his enemies, uh, those who have uh, hurt him, and also he forgives the past. He, for, he was a forgiving person of past ills. He doesn't sit down and dwell in the past. Let past be past. Number eight, he was a very disciplined person and he walked in integrity. So discipline and integrity. Number nine, he had economic skills, economic skills. He was economic expert, economic expert. I want us to look at verse 41, 33, and 35. I think I mentioned this the other time, but let's look at that 41, 33, and 35, because next Sunday, I'm going to show us a bit of um, cash flow, simple cash flow model, simply ca cash flow forecast. Everyone connected here, you must learn how to do a very simple cash flow model for your uh, business or your project for anything you do. Yeah, for your investment, simple cash flow. So we're gonna do that. So Joseph had economic skill, which is number nine, he was an economic expert and he used that to advise Pharaoh. Look at, uh, so 41, I say we should read verses 33 through 35. He said, now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth, one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. You are to save 20%, one fifth is 20%. You must learn to save 20% of your income. The formula is this, or the principle is this. At 20% saving, in five years, you reproduce 100%. Do you understand that? In five years, you reproduce 100%. So if you have 100, or if you have 1 million, 1 million Naira, and you keep that 1 million Naira and you get 20% interest on top. In five years, that your 1 million Naira will become 2 million in the list, in the list. Now, the power of compounding will take effect. Praise the name of the Lord. The power of compounding will take effect and that 1 million will be more than 2 million. So, the final thing to say about Joseph, he was full of the spirit of God and wisdom. He was full of the spirit of God and wisdom. Now you can see this in verse 39, 2 to 3, the Lord was with him. 21 to 22 of verse 39, the Lord was with him. Verse 40, verse 8, you will see there, the Lord was with him. Now let's look at verse 41, 15 and 16. That's where I want us to read. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. 16, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then we jump. To 37 and 40. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servant, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you 
all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. The spirit of God dwell in Joseph. God was with him. And that is the parallel with us today. We have the Holy Spirit. So we can enjoy all that Joseph enjoyed and much more than that. God bless you. So I'll pause here and let's just take another five minutes or so and hear other contributions or questions. Yes, Sister Gertrude, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Nana. Pastor and Sister Gloria, Dara, and um, Sonny, thank you for your questions and your contribution. Um, I don't know, here is Father's Day. So I want to wish everybody in this platform happy Father's Day. Yeah, thank and you for beating me to it. I thought I would do it at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and also I want to let's and learn from to the example day to everybody connected. God bless you. Okay. Let's learn from Jacob, Joseph's father. Joseph was his favorite because he, he stated in the scripture that he, he got him in old age. So Joseph was his favorite. I don't know, I think as fathers, we should have that balance. We should be able to help other siblings. Yeah. But, so, but it looks as if Jacob left everything like that. So because of Joseph being his favorite, he sold him a coat of many colors and Joseph will bring, Joseph was very hardworking because he never said no to the father. Whatever the father asked him, he would do it. And I will have such a child as my favorite too. But you, we should be able to have a balance as fathers between father, making somebody, yes, between making one child a favorite and also helping others not to hate that child yeah. because they really hated that child. Yeah. And he didn't even have any clean. When they brought the stained, he stained coat. So he brought him, oh, he just said, oh, an animal had killed him. Yeah. He didn't even have suspect that the brothers would have killed him or something like that sort. So yeah. what I'm just saying, after wishing you Father's Day, please be careful and ask the Lord to help you so that to be able to have a balance between yeah. having a child as your favorite and also helping others to love him, not to hate him. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You so much. Thank you. That is indeed very good. Thank okay. you. So, yeah. So the, 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 the so sorry, the, I want to uh, sorry, Ma, just to say that the balance is for father and mothers. In fact, mothers are even worse culprit on this one, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Yes, mothers are worse culprit on this one. In fact, I listened to uh, in a, a, a radio discussion on this subject some time ago, where a woman called in and said, Till, and they are adults now with their own children, till today, their own children cannot mix because of the strife the mother created amongst them from this favorite child thing. I listened to another who said, unfortunately, the one that was called favorite child didn't turn out to be the strongest of all, you know, because the reason of the mother may have been circumstantial, like I said before. Anyway, whatever it is, I agree with you. You may have a reason to have a favorite child, favorite child, but strike the balance. Mother, strike the balance. Father, strike the balance. Brothers and sisters, strike the balance. And in that radio comment also, a, a child called in, well, I use a child, and said it happened amongst them, but somehow two sisters, they found a way to reconcile and they loved each other. It was such a beautiful story. And now uh, she said, the one that was calling was the older one. I think she said real wide age gap between them. So just like you've said, the Joseph and the father, a child of old age. The, child, the other person was a younger child and the other one, but they reconciled and said, oh, now they are two best friends doing everything together. So that's uh, what is encouraged. Okay, uh, Sister Gertrude, please go ahead.
Yes. Yeah, after after reading the chapter, the early life of uh, Joseph when he was seventeen, um, and also his dreams. So I uh, um, you know, I used to blame him for being so. He would have a dream and go and share with the brothers, and he knew that this brother did. I don't know whether he knew that the brothers didn't like him. So I don't know if he had kept the dreams to himself, what would have happened? But now with what you have um, told us, you know, I'm a bit, so I don't have to blame him for sharing the, the dreams. You know, whatever God had allowed him even to share those dreams, it was for a purpose anyway. So I don't know. I don't know whether, whenever, I think we should be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. What he tells us to share, we should share. It's not everything we have to share and open up, you know, to people. I think yeah. that came out to me, yeah. the sensitivity. Yes, Thank uh, you. we hear people say that blaming Joseph for sharing the dream. Let me tell you that your mouth is a prophecy. So there are, like you have said, the key is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Don't join those who use their human wisdom to be telling people Joseph could have kept quiet over his dream. If he kept quiet, how would his brother have hated him? If he kept quiet, how would his brother have sold him? How would he have gone to Potiphar's house and got all that training in the house of the officer of Pharaoh already prepared to deliver the posterity of Israel that God prepared him? So the key is being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. A closed lip is a closed destiny. Don't close your lips over your destiny. Declare your destiny. Let the walls hear it. Let the heavens hear it. Let the earth hear it. Let the spirits hear it. They can do nothing about it. The word of God says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So don't follow that human wisdom. It is God's Holy Spirit that should guide us. Yes, there are moments the Holy Spirit will tell you, keep quiet, and you keep quiet. There are moments the Holy Spirit will say, this is for some time to come. Say nothing about it. There are many of us who have received even dreams and visions about, the, about nations, and we have not shared it. And it has died like that because we have not shared it. So it is not true that Joseph... If he kept quiet, he, the dream, he, he would not have been sold. He needed to share it and he shared it. If he kept quiet, something else would have happened. As bad as it happened for that dream to come to pass. So it is a perfect model to use, actually. A vision are to be made clear. It's not to be kept in the heart. Write it down, make it clear. That's what the Bible says. He said, write down the vision and make it plain that whoever reads may run. People must know exactly who and what you stand for. As we said today, for a person with a vision, every trial is an opportunity for triumph. Never forget that. Praise the name of the Lord. For such a person, he or she knows what his destination feels like, what it smells like, and those who should be around him while, when he arrives there. So anytime he does not have that comfort, anytime he doesn't smell like his destination, he knows. Anytime the people who should be around are not the people in his destination, he knows, she knows, I am not yet there. I've got to press on. Glory be to God. Sister Comfort, please. Let's still be a little while. Let's hear Sister Comfort. Yes, have the floor now. And thank you everyone <laughs> for such nice, beautiful yeah. contribution. I'm excited. Go thank ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you all, the, my sisters and Brother Dara and others who have made their contribution. I will see, it seems we women think the same way. <laughs> My question was on that at 37, 
I even write, I wrote, why did his brothers, why did Joseph's brothers hate him? So, and uh, you can, we can see Sister Gertrude, Sister Gloria, we all put our concern there because of uh, uh, the concern of parents. But uh, when we look at that, uh, verses uh, 18 of chapter 37, it's, but they saw him a long way off before he reached them. They made plans to kill him. Yes, uh, you might have the right skill, you may do the right thing, but if people hate you because of their bad attitude, because of their bad behavior, then do you, you don't have anything to, you can't do anything. So that, uh, it was because of the song we sang that the devil waits for your unguarded hour. He knows that you are not aware of their plans, but they have their, their plan against you. But when you have, the only way you can overcome this, their plan is having God, God being there for you, like he was for Joseph. So they hated him, even though his father uh, made him his favorite child. It was for a reason. It was not out of a, uh, order. The father saw some uniqueness, like you have said. Yes. So we parents, we may have the discernment, the wisdom of understanding our children, what is in them. Uh, like Gertrude said, how are we able to bring this uh, quality of our sons or of our daughters that we have discovered to the others so that they also understand and see if they can copy him. Yes. That is one way, but if they have a bad heart and they don't want, what do we do? So yes. we should be like Joseph. So my prayer, when I, I ask this question, I say, God, help me to remain focused like Joseph. Even when they put him in that pit, I don't know if he did cry. Mm -hmm. So like Sister Gertrude said, sensitive yeah. to Holy Spirit. He may have cried. Okay, perhaps, uh, we don't know. Yeah. In uh, Potiphar's house, when he was uh, disturbed, he didn't say it. Mm -hmm. He only said, a, uh, talk when it is necessary. So yeah. what I'm trying to say, let us not always blame ourselves. Mm -mm. Because of bad people. Yes. But let us remain focused. Mm -hmm. So long as we have the righteousness of God, mm -hmm. we have our conscience clear with God, we remain mm -hmm. focused, we remain uh, diligent in our uh, work, let God decide for us. Amen. Amen. Thank so, you for that contribution. Thank, Thank you indeed, very sound point. To emphasize again, the three parties involved, parents, favorite child, and the others, we must all live Christians, as Christians. The central life we must live is love. Let's not forget that. So the parents should do a lot especially where there have been strife amongst the children because of some children being seen as favorite or some feeling like, uh, oh, they are no good. The parents should strike the balance. They should get involved in helping to resolve the children and helping them understand the differences in people and in them. And the parents should really re um, uh, reassure all the children that they are loved equally. You see, favorite child doesn't necessarily mean that the parent, I mean, at least as a Christian mother, a Christian father, 
does not necessarily mean that you hate the others. In some setting that a non-Christian, maybe somebody will do that. But that's not what we're discussing here. It just, uh, that preference often may, may be uh, mistaken by the other children as you don't like them, you like one. So such parents should not shy away from reassuring all the children that you love them. That's one way of handling it. So let's be practical here. You must be sensitive enough to know that you have created a strife. You have been the one creating that have created the strife amongst your children. Negative strife, not the positive competition. And therefore, you should try to address it. It's not by telling them that this one is favorite. They will observe, they will know. But it's to just reassure everyone, I love you, my daughter. I love you, my son. I love you, you know, we should do that. Where we see conflict, we should also then address it impartially, impartially. If you send one to like um, uh, the, my, uh, my wife was saying, if you, a spoiled child, don't uh, raise up a spoiled child. It is totally wrong. A spoiled child will not learn the necessary discipline. So favorite doesn't mean being spoiled. If you send one to clean the house, you should also apportion to the other one to clean the house. If your own way of saying favorite child is by you send one to clean the house and then the other one doesn't clean, you're asking for trouble. Oh, you come, the other one has done something wrong. Instead of you addressing it, you, you score the other one on behalf of that. You have creating problems. So the balance is very necessary. And if it has already happened, you have to address it. Don't let it grow with them into adulthood and they begin to strive and pass it to their children as uh, the situation I had on the radio. Thank you very much for that. Then the second point that has already been emphasized, as she has said, needs to be re-emphasized, is that you cannot be liked by everyone when you do the right thing. You cannot be liked by everyone because you do the right thing. So being liked by everyone or being liked by somebody does not define righteousness. In fact, sometimes or most times, people will hate you for doing the right thing. I think she has emphasized that. So always look at your own self and say, what, have, what am I in the will of God? Am I doing what God wants me to do? If the spirit of God say, yes, carry on, please carry on. So that's why one of the qualities of Joseph that we talk about was rugged and resilient. He was rugged and resilient. You can say very rugged. For such a person to go through all that at the age of 17, imagine that. And from there till when he came to the throne. He went through all that. He was not bitter. Mm. He was not a negative person. Mm. He tells you he was very rugged and resilient. This is, these are the qualities we should develop. Mm. So we'll bring it to a wrap up here. And we want to pray specifically on this matter of strife in the family. Brothers and sisters, amongst uh, children of God, every strife, we want to pray that God will send his peace to us and give us the wisdom to manage that. But before we round off with that prayer, let me just check. Is there any last point anybody wants to share, wants to mention? Okay. Our time is far spent, so let us pray.
Let us agree together as we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us your principles as practiced in the life of Joseph. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us and give us your spirit and the wisdom to put this same principles into practice and help us to de develop our leadership capabilities in the spirit of God and take us to that place of destiny that you have kept for us in life in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray, make our visions clear, your vision for our lives clear. Help us to understand your plan and your purpose for our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we pray for our families. We pray, let your peace reign. Lord, anywhere we have caused strife by our own uh, 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 ways, by the, our own ignorance, uh, by creating favorite children, in any other way we have created strife in our family, we repent and we ask, Lord, Give us the wisdom to balance such now. And Lord, we pray you cause your peace to reign. We pray you cause our children to love themselves. We pray you cause us who are also children uh, in, to our father, our parents, our mothers, Lord, our fathers, to love one another. Let us be the center of peace in our families, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, our Lord and our God. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. The Almighty God bless you, brothers and sisters. And at this point, let us join our voices and pray for all the fathers that the Almighty God will make the fathers excellent fathers. In the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you.